Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. Uh, I'm excited today because I expect to come out of this podcast ready to wage war, basically, uh, because I have an expert with me. Christopher Matthew is the man to go to if he wants to talk about ancient battles. He has worked for film and television, currently lectures at the Australian Catholic University in Sydney. He's here today because he's written a monumental book about a facet of ancient warfare that you're all going to find familiar. Chris, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me on the show. It's uh, great to be here and hello to everyone else out there. This is going to be good. So we're going to be talking today about the pike phalanx, aren't we? So first of yes. all, in case anyone is, is still confused, can you describe what this formation looks like? Okay, so in its most basic configuration, the phalanx is simply a huge block of men arranged just in ranks and files armed with very long pikes called the sarissa. Uh, these weapons were over five metres in length and they were commonly used in the armies of the ancient Macedonians from the 4th century BC through to the 2nd century BC. So in, for example, the army of Alexander the Great. The formation was normally 16 deep, uh, but it could be deployed to a half depth of eight uh, and so the smallest group within this bigger formation is the half file of eight men, which had an officer at the front and the back to keep everyone in line. If you had two half files deployed one behind the other, you get a thing called a locos or a file of 16 men. Two files made a delochia of 32 men, four files a tetrarchia of 64 men, and all the way through to uh, 16 files of 256 men, which is a unit called a syntagma. This is the smallest operational unit, uh, one that can operate fairly independently on the battlefield within the phalanx. But you can just keep going, doubling the size of the unit each time up to um, a unit called a phalangarchia, which is 256 files of roughly 4,000 men, or a deflangarchia, which is two flangarchia, um, so that's 8,000 men, and right up to what is called a tetraflangarchia, which is 1,024 files of more than 16,000 men. Um, so this means the, the formation itself could be massive. Um, each man occupied a space of about half a metre square, and so if you think of a tetraflangarchia with 1,024 files, that means it's just over 500 metres wide. And if it goes to a half depth of only eight men per file, then it's a kilometre across. Um, when they're deployed, regardless of the configuration, the weapons held by the men in the first five ranks are lowered into a position to engage the enemy, while the remainder in the rearward ranks hold their pikes forward at an angle of about 45 degrees over the heads of the men in front. And this provides uh, a level of protection against volleys of incoming missile fire. So if an enemy lobs a whole lot of arrows at an oncoming phalanx, as they fall onto the formation, they'll get tangled up in this sort of hedge of upright pikes and basically just fall harmlessly onto the ground or the people below. Um, the other great thing about this formation is because it's made up of these building blocks of units and subunits, it could also be deployed in a whole variety of other shapes and configurations, such as an oblique line or an open square, or a wedge, uh, so it's a very adaptable 
means of fighting en masse. This is brilliant. Um, you've mentioned that mass, it's a Macedonian facet of war. That's what we associate with it. But do we know who it is? Is it them that invented it? And when do we see the first evidence of it in use? So the Macedonian pike phalanx sort of evolves from the earlier Greek hoplite phalanx that was commonly used in the 5th century by city-states like Athens and Sparta. Uh, the hoplites, the soldiers in those formations, uh, had a, a large round shield about a metre in diameter and a short spear about two and a half metres in length, which still gave them quite good reach on the battlefield. But if you are someone who's going to come up and fight against such a formation, the best way to counter it is to use a longer weapon. And so in the ancient sources, we have an account of, in two different sources, um, an account of a fellow by the name of Ephicrates, who is actually an Athenian. And in 374 BC, he comes up with this military reform, which doubles the length of the spear used by the traditional hoplites and reduces the diameter of the shield from a metre down to 64 centimetres. Uh, this is basically the forerunner for the Macedonian phalanx. Uh, the reason why the shield needs to get reduced in size is this big pike or this double-length spear um, is too big and too heavy to wield one-handed, so it has to become a two-handed weapon. And with this smaller shield, which gets strapped onto your left forearm um, through a, a central armband, your left hand extends beyond the rim of the shield and is then able to be used to help carry the weapon. Now, unfortunately, and for some reason that's never explained in the ancient sources, Athens doesn't seem to adopt this reform that Ephicrates comes up with. Um, so he goes off to Macedon, um, they're being ruled by their king, Amentas, who rules from 392 to 370 BC. But Ephicrates is also very good friends with the heir apparent, who comes into power as Alexander II um, when he comes to the throne in 370 on the death of Amentas. And so the reform to the Macedonian military seems to have probably begun under Amentas and is fully completed and implemented by Alexander II. Uh, in terms of its first recorded use, the evidence in the ancient literature is a bit sketchy, uh, but it has to have been sometime after 374. The, there is a reference to a so-called Macedonian phalanx um, in the army of Philip II. This is the father of Alexander the yeah. Great when he's fighting against the Phokians in 353. Uh, but I doubt it took the Macedonians 20 years to fully implement this reform. This is fascinating. So before we start talking about um, how you employ them in battle, I want to give people a really good picture of what someone looks like going into battle. So at the risk of sounding horrifically girly, uh, what do the soldiers wear? The guys that are armed with these, uh, how are they kitted out themselves? So the, the Macedonians create basically the first state-funded professional standing army in European history. Okay. So almost everything is supplied by the state, but there are um, abilities to sort of customise and personalise your equipment. So your basic infantryman in terms of, say, helmet, would have a very basic conical bronze helmet called a pelos. Uh, officers, on the other hand, they would have more distinctive helmets with face plates and cheek guards um, and with particular crests and plumes to identify their rank. Um, this helmet would weigh one to two kilos, depending upon it, what style it is. Uh, they would also have linen armour over a basic tuning. Now, linen armour sounds a bit dodgy. Um, it's made by basically gluing layers of linen together to make a composite material that is somewhat similar to modern Kevlar. Um, it weighs about five kilograms. 
It has sort of flaps cut into the base of it so that your legs can move. It hangs down to just above the knees. It has reinforced shoulder sections to protect the upper body. Uh, based on um, grave paintings and other images we have of the members of the phalanx, some of these are brightly decorated and coloured, others are left plain. Uh, they also have this small shield, uh, which is called a pelter. Again, weighs about five kilos, uh, 64 centimetres in diameter, a wooden core uh, covered with a facing of metal. Um, and depending upon your regiment would sort of signify what metal you have on it. Some are bronze, some are silver. Uh, there's references to gold covered shields. And there's also regimental designs on the shield as well. Um, it has a, a central armband, so it mounts onto the left forearm and sits just in the crook of the elbow. And it has a, a strap called an akane, which extends from either side of the shield up over the head and sits on the, the right shoulder to allow some of its weight to be carried. Then you have this long pike uh, called the sarissa. This is their main weapon. Um, in the early Hellenistic period in the fourth century, it's about five metres in length. Later on, they experiment with longer and longer pikes as you start to get phalanx fighting phalanx in the time after the death of Alexander. And they get up to over seven metres in length, uh, but that seems to become too unwieldy. And so they drop it back uh, to a shorter length towards the end of the Hellenistic period. But that's going to weigh somewhere between five and seven kilograms as well. You've got boots. You have uh, metal shin guards. Uh, again, sort of one to two kilos, depending upon how much there is. A sword weighing maybe um, a kilo, kilo and a half. And so you would be carrying approximately 20 kilos of equipment. Uh, but it's distributed all over the body, unlike, say, a modern soldier who has most of his equipment in a backpack and he's webbing. Yeah. Um, the, the important thing about what these guys are wearing is the, the two main elements of the shield and the sarissa itself. They create a, a mutually supporting system. Um, what I mean by that is the shoulder strap, the akane, sits on your right shoulder and is connected to the shield. The shield is then mounted on your forearm, which allows your arm to extend beyond the rim to hold the pike. And because everything is connected, the shoulder strap of the shield actually also holds some of the weight of the, this lengthy weapon as well. So it's a, a very um, robust style of uniform for lack of a better term yeah uh, which yeah. allows them to really engage in some fierce combat it's great because i like in in my head i don't know you think because i'm a modern historian i obviously look at the ancient world and think oh they're there they don't have tvs and stuff like that and and they're not as smart as we were here's a stick go and fight with it but it's really not that simple is it this is like a technology that's evolved over centuries in the ancient world yes it's very much a uh, almost an arms race where you get from sort of the early archaic period in ancient Greece and you start to get more and more use of formation fighting in the classical period. And then when you get to the Hellenistic period, they have to come up with a way to defeat the classical formations. And so they come up with the pike phalanx. Before we talk about... Um how one of these looks going into battle and what they do in battle. Um, really, so we've talked about it so far. We know that they can um, form, if you like, a big barrier on mass and that. But as a personal weapon, um, is this something that you are supposed to stick in another person? It's quite hard not to. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the weapon itself, um, it's very, very heavy. Uh, it has a very small head on it, so it's probably taken from the earlier hoplite spears, weighs about 175 grams. But then you've got five to seven metres of wooden shaft with an average diameter of about 34 millimetres, so that's going to weigh somewhere between 
sort of four and six kilos. Yeah, because um, it's just like, in, it in a... essence, it, it's been invented as one man's weapon to stab the enemy with. Like we, so far, we're talking about how they then, like, sort of amp this up to 16,000 of one mass at the same time. But, it, I mean, this is what they're for, and this is what they're expected to do with it when they get close enough, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it seems that most of the the fighting with the Sarissa itself is designed not so much to sort of stab your enemy, um, which is incredibly easy to do with something this heavy, um, but more to stick it into the shield of your enemy, mm. hold their formation in place, while more mobile troops within the Macedonian army, such as cavalry, skirmishers, and so on, swing around from the sides and hit the enemy in the flanks. So it really is this sort of um, concerted effort to literally pin the enemy down while they get encircled. I mean, am I overthinking it, or is this genius? Because they've developed a way to cut down on the hand-to-hand -hand combat where man ends up like in the same like half metre square as another man trying to kill him. And that protects your army, it protects the numbers of your army, it reduces your casualties. Am I massively overthinking it or is it that clever? It is that clever. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that made the classical Greek phalanx so successful against other opponents that fought in a different style, say when the Persians invaded in 490 or in 480 BC, was the fact that with their two and a half metre spears, they could still hold an enemy in a position where with, say, a sword or an axe or something like that, they couldn't actually reach the Greek on the other side. Um, and this is, in essence, why the phalanx is for the Macedonians is made the way it is. If you've got ancient Greeks that you're fighting against, and this is one of the opponents that the Macedonians went up against in the, the mid fourth century, you have to outreach them. And so by having a longer weapon in the form of the Sarissa, you can literally pin them in place and then let your skirmishers come round and sort of hack down these heavily armed ancient Greeks just from the sides where they're most vulnerable. I think, so this is, um, to put it into perspective, this thing is half as long as a double-decker bus, as a London bus, um, which, yeah, yeah. does it have a weakness as a weapon? Is it a lack of mobility? Yeah, there are a couple of sort of downsides to this weapon, um, it's not very manoeuvrable. Um, it's not really designed for one-on-one -on -one combat, although there are some references uh, in the ancient literature to people engaging in duels where they're armed with a sarissa. I mean, I certainly wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but if an enemy can get sort of inside the reach of the pike, um, then the the member of the phalanx becomes vulnerable. Now, what I mean by that is when you're holding one of these things, um, about four and a half metres of the weapon sticks out in front of you. Mm. But if an opponent can somehow dodge the spear tip or the, the tip of the pike and move in closer, because you're in this massed formation, you can't really take a couple of steps back and try and reposition yourself. So this is why they have the members of the first five ranks lower their weapons for combat. Um, so they're staggered because one man's behind the other. But if an opponent gets past the tip of the pike held by the first man, he still has to face the other four. So he'll never get close enough to attack, say, with a sword. Um, on the whole, the formation cannot easily turn because of all of these extended pikes mm. to meet an unexpected threat um, that attacks, say, from the sides. The, the phalanx is really designed for a face-on fight. Uh, furthermore, you can't really thrust with it too much um, due to the limitations imposed by having a shield strapped on your left arm and the shoulder strap running up over your body. 
And so it doesn't have a lot of reach beyond just being lowered into position. I was just going to say, so I, I see that it's it's designed really well to lower and thrust, but then doing that a second time, you're already in trouble a bit, aren't you? Yes, it does have um, a tremendous amount of power that you can put behind it. Um, and this is one of its other sort of downsides, I guess, if you put too much power into an attack with it, it will easily go right through the body of an opponent. And again, because you're in this massed formation, you've got no way of withdrawing the weapon to keep fighting. So you don't want to thrust too much with it. Yeah, I I think because if it takes a tremendous amount of power to thrust it in and go for a human body getting it out again is going to be just st- even more difficult because it wasn't designed to go in that direction. No. <clears throat> wow. Um, is there like an ultimate move, like a knockout punch you can deliver um, or that they would be striving for with this pike? Or is it all about holding the formation? So you can um, thrust about 50 centimetres with one of these things because of the, the limitations with the shield and the the shoulder strap Um, and because it's just so incredibly heavy. Um, But mostly the formation would just deploy the first five ranks would lower their weapons into position and you would either wait for the enemy to come to you or the whole line would advance slowly towards an enemy to maintain the formation. But the Sarissa doesn't seem to primarily be a strike weapon. Um, that being said, if you once you're engaged, if you're holding an opponent at bay and an opportune target presents itself, and they suddenly move their shield out of their way for whatever reason, you can thrust at the chest, which is basically the biggest target. Um, and the other great thing about this lengthy weapon is that a very small adjustment in angle at the rear where you are holding it equates to quite a change in elevation for the tip. So it doesn't take a lot of effort to go for the head, go for the legs um, or anywhere on an opponent's body. Um, And any of that will be almost an instant kill shot due to the tremendous power that can come from an attack that is delivered with one of these things. I want to talk about what, one of these formations looks like in all its glory um, in a second. But just quickly, um, it strikes me that the second it goes wrong and your formation breaks or people start dropping the pikes, like you have a lot of very vulnerable men being overrun. Is that right? Yes, that's one of the, the weaknesses of the formation itself. Um, it can't turn very well. Uh, maybe you might be able to get a subunit on either wing to turn and face an enemy, but they're not going to be able to put up a lot of resistance if it's, say, a dedicated cavalry charge or something like that. Um, If you do start to break up the phalanx and create gaps in the line, then it becomes particularly vulnerable because of how um, immobile this weapon is once it's deployed for combat. And this is one of the things that allowed the Romans to defeat a Macedonian phalanx at the Battle of Pydna in 168. Um, They were using much more mobile troops with their short Roman swords. Uh, They were able to create gaps in the line of the Macedonian phalanx, and they just had these troops sort of pour in and just start hacking them to pieces. So it is essential for the Macedonian phalanx to maintain the formation as best as possible. Do we know, do we have anything? I know ancient sources are more limited. I'm spot rotten during the First World War. Do we have any accounts from people facing one of these? Because I'm guessing looking at these first five ranks lowered and all the guys behind it must have been pretty terrifying for an advancing army. Yeah, we do get quite a number of references from right across the, the Hellenistic period uh, describing the um, the phalanx in action. Um, so it is, is described by one writer as an invincible beast. 
Uh, Alexander's phalanx is said to advance like a flood. So it's just like a tidal wave of spears that's coming at people. Uh, one of the Roman commanders at the Battle of Pydna said it was one of the most terrifying things he'd ever seen, mm. having one of these pike phalanxes advance against his line. Uh, so we do get um, a reference to that. And one of the, the other things that sort of scares people, it seems, is because these weapons are so long, um, as you march with them, they sort of bounce and wave about. Uh, so it's not this, it, it's like a, a moving entity coming, living creature coming yeah. at you. Um, it would have just scared the pants off people if they actually wore pants and not just tunics in those days. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. It's like, like That's probably where that flood analogy comes from because it would look like waves moving towards you, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. So let's talk about what one of these, because I mean, we, we've talked about the downsides and we've talked about how vulnerable it is and how immobile it is, but they continued using it for a reason um, and they were yes. successful doing so. So, I mean, if you want, pick one of your favourite battles. So we got to the point where the first five ranks have lowered their, um, everybody else has got them at a 45 degree angle and they're ready to go. The uh, shit scared advancing army is coming towards them. Um, in all its glory, what does one of these formations do? So it really depends on the, the nature of the battle itself. I mean, people come up with very creative and inventive ways to try and defeat a pike phalanx. Um, once Alexander had died and all of his successors were squabbling amongst themselves over the, the remnants of his empire, yet they were using elephants to charge into the phalanx like a bowling ball and just smash it apart. Uh, and things like that. Uh, it doesn't really work because, you know, elephants aren't overly stupid. They're not going to charge into a yeah. big They're also, also not spear-proof either, are they? No, they're not. And once they're wounded, they're more often than not going to panic, turn around and charge back into your own formation. Um, so they're very unreliable creatures. Having been charged by a three-ton elephant who wanted the bag of cucumbers I was holding because she's a fat pig, uh, I can empathise with this. It's not a place you want to be. <laughs> no. No, but, um, I mean, regardless of the, the battle itself, um, I mean, the, the, the Sarissa is a, a deadly, deadly weapon. Uh, paradoxically, because of the exact same thing that makes it so unwieldy, its weight, um, it also makes it incredibly effective. Um, we get references um, for one of Alexander's battles where his pikemen are able to thrust their weapons through enemy shields, through their armour and pierce their lungs. Um, now, that, that can be sort of worked out quite easily using a, a formula that's used by the US Army ballistics labs. Um, it's basically just the, the energy of the thrust um, is the weight of the weapon times the velocity that you um, thrust it forward with divided by 64, which is just a value for the gravitational constant. Now, you need two foot pounds of pressure to penetrate skin. Um, 34 foot pounds will penetrate the plate metal armour that was used by the Greeks um, if you hit it at a 40 degree angle of impact. If you hit it perpendicular at 90 degrees, you only need 24 foot pounds. Um, the, the average thrust for one of these heavy weapons is probably just over six metres a second and the weight of it is about five and a half kilos, which means that through this very small head on the tip of it, uh, you're delivering 81 foot pounds of pressure. Yeah. Um, so that's easily going to go through any armor, any shield. Um, we get a, a, another reference, again, coming from the Battle of Pydna in 168, about the effect of momentum. Um, and at Pydna, there was a group called the Polygnians who were auxiliaries fighting for the Romans 
um, who for some strange reason decided to charge with fury and abandon onto the front of the pike phalanx. Um, and we're told it pierced shields, breastplates, bodies, went right through people. Um, and I mean, if you assume that these polygnians weigh about 100 kilos with their kit and they advance even just at a brisk walk of five kilometres an hour, then the combined momentum of their charge and, say, a small thrust at the point of contact results in the delivery of an energy of 665 foot-pounds through the tip of the, the pike. And that's easily going to go through anything. It's terrifying, isn't it? So what's the biggest one we know of in action and what did it do? The biggest Formate. pike? The biggest, oh, biggest formation. Um, there's one of the, the battles later on in the successor period. I mean, most of the battles of the successor period are quite big, even mm. compared to those of Alexander, um, where there's pike phalanx versus pike phalanx as two of the different um, surviving generals or their descendants of Alexander um, fight against each other for supremacy in the Hellenistic world. And these things would have just been horrendous contests where you had two lines of you know, 100,000 men smashing away at each other with these pikes with cavalry charges on the wings, possibly elephants charging through the centre as well, um, archers, slingers, other light troops, uh, it would have just been an absolute nightmare to be in one of these battles. Terrific. Right, just lastly, what is the anvil? The anvil? Yeah. So when we look at, say, the battles of Alexander the Great, as an example, um, the pike phalanx really seems to act as an anvil and... His cavalry on the right wing acts more like a hammer. Um, now, Alexander's regarded as one of the, the greatest commanders of antiquity. When you look at him as a tactician, he's not all that innovative. Um, he knows what works. He knows how to best employ his different types of troops. And in his four main set-piece battles at Granicus and Issus and Galgamela and Hydaspes, he uses fundamentally the exact same tactic, and that is have the pike phalanx slowly advance forward in the centre while his companion cavalry, positioned on his right wing, swing around and deliver a right hook to the enemy. Now, there's a reason why he does this right hook manoeuvre and say, doesn't deliver it from the left, and that is that most people back in that day and age would be carrying their shield on their left arm. Mm. So if the enemy stays facing the pike phalanx, has their shields presented to this wall of pike points, then they're just going to get mowed down from the side from the cavalry. But if they turn to their left to face this oncoming cavalry, it opens up the whole right side of their body to the pikes. And Can so I it's just a say this is vindication for why the British drive on the left, because apparently it's so that right-handed people can draw their sword in the face of an oncoming knight or whatever. So for all you people that laugh at us for driving on the left-hand side of the road, if a phalanx comes at us, we're sorted. We're ready for battle. You lot are screwed. Yep. <laughs> I wouldn't be trying to use a, a Sarissa out of a car window, but yeah. something shorter would probably do. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> um, I, it sounds like there are a couple of battles that have been a complete goldmine for you in terms of putting this, this information together. But what kind of sources have you used to get this level of detail? And, and have you, because I so would use this as an excuse to, have you conducted experiments? Uh, so in terms of the source material, there, were, there is a lot of ancient literature out there on the pike phalanx. We have several different writers who did, for example, histories of the campaign of Alexander. Uh, we also have 
another historian that covers the later successor period. There are writers of books of stratagems. There are three existing military manuals for how to operate a pike phalanx. Um, So they were invaluable. Uh, There's a lot of modern scholarship out there that I had to go through as well. Um, And then I did a lot of experimentation as well, um, using a recreated um, hop-like panoply, a full kit of Macedonian gear uh, that I had made by a professional armourer. Um, And I also was lucky enough to um, hook up with a a bunch of reenactors who just happened to have all their own Macedonian kit as well. So we could try things like small formations uh, to see how that worked. Um, We used the weapons in ballistics labs to look at things like penetration power, uh, how much reach you had. Um, how hard it is to sort of do drill, just moving from one position to another with any of these things. I mean, it was a really fun way to research um, this sort of thing. I mean, this, this is something that's not new. I mean, even as far back as the classical age, the Athenian writer Xenophon said that you can often tell how to use a weapon by picking it up. And so I took the essence of what Xenophon said uh, literally and said, well, if I really want to understand how a pike phalanx works, then I've got to get kitted out, feel how the armour is distributed on my body, Um, see how easy it is to penetrate a target of plate metal. Um, Shadow box with a sarissa and see how fatiguing it is. Um, That then gives me ideas that I can link back to the ancient texts. So when they're talking about, you know, a battle that goes for six hours, I start thinking to myself, you know, could I have really done this for six hours? Now, I was going to ask you about does, with a weapon this heavy um, and a force this immobile, I mean, like in, in my head, because my head doesn't operate like everyone else's, I'm like, what happens when the first person needs the toilet? Um, how long does a battle go on? And what is the sort of physical endurance limit that men can take of being deployed in this formation? Do you, I mean, you're saying that you figured out that six hours is starting to look unrealistic. Um. Well, I mean, there's going to be a lot of variables that come into play to determine the length of any battle. Uh, The Battle of Chironea, where the Macedonians take on the Greeks in 338, is said to have lasted for a long time. Now, unfortunately, the uh, ancient texts don't elaborate on what they think a long time was. Um, Similarly, Alexander's assault on the city of Thebes in 335 is also described as going for a long time. Um, Alexander's battle at Galgamela against the Persians in 331 goes from around midday till dusk, so that's probably six hours. Uh, The Battle of Paratechani in 317 uh, is described as going for a considerable time and continues on after sunset under the light of a full moon. Um, At the other end of the scale, however, the Battle of Pydna in 168, where basically the dominance of the pike phalanx is shattered by the Romans, uh, only goes for about an hour. Uh, So commanders, I suppose, couldn't really tell how long a battle would probably go for. Um, And so the best way would just be to have, you know, very experienced, very fit troops um, that can stand up to the turmoils of campaigning. Uh, That being said, because of the way that you're not really thrusting too much with this weapon and the way it's supported by the shoulder strap of the the shield, um, you can hold it in place for quite a a considerable amount of time um, so long as you're holding it at its point of balance. Uh, If you move sort of either side of the point of balance, then it starts to fatigue the muscles of the arms quite a bit. 
This is brilliant. So you just mentioned Gal Gamella. Uh, that, I remember, is in that hideous Colin Farrell film. Um, <laughs> but if people want to actually get some kind of visual on this uh, is that one that makes you scream at the screen because it's so wrong or is it all right or what film should they watch so they can see one of these things in action like it would have happened yeah the the battle scene for Gal Gamella in Oliver Stone's Alexander is actually excellent mm. um, it's one of the few ancient themed films that I don't scream at um Yes, acting. there is a from a military a, perspective. I mean, from an acting yes. perspective, and that let, let's not even go there. But yes, from, we that's won't go a there. Good one. Yeah, but yes, the the way that they are moving around in the the squares, the the syntagmi of sixteen by sixteen, the way they've got the pikes lowered, um, yeah, it's very well done. Excellent. Any others? Uh, no, I would stick with that. Brilliant. Okay. So that is, I bet no one expected to listen to this podcast and end up being vindicated for watching that film. Um, But do give it a go (laughs) if you want to have a look and see uh, a Pike Phalanx in action. Uh, Thank you so much, Chris, for coming on to talk to us about this. I didn't think it was possible to get such a sort of personal view of what it was like to fight in one of these battles down to sort of how it felt to hold the weapon and everything because I'm one of these people that believes that there's not a lot out there for the ancient historians because they all come on here and they all say oh we don't know that and we don't know that and we don't know that but um this is amazing for the level of detail and what it feels like uh, the book the invincible beast talks about the phalanx in detail uh goes over everything we talked about and much much more it's available on the history hack bookshop do go and buy it chris thank you so much thank you for having me on the show it was an absolute pleasure when our guests join us to talk about their work in their new book the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great 